<laughs> well, good morning, Epic Church. How is everybody? Before you take your seat this morning, everybody give a shout out to our Facebook Live campus and internet campus and all around the world. We love you guys. Thank you for being with us. As you sit down, high five somebody. Tell them it's going to be an epic day. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for being with us. We're in a series entitled Edge of Your Seat. Everybody say Edge of Your Seat. So hopefully we're going to keep you there today and for the next four weeks. Um, as just a really quick reminder, uh, Pastor Derek and I will be speaking on the topic of racism next weekend. So Sunday on Thursday, we'll tackle that. And then Sunday at 9 and 11, we'll tackle that. So make sure that you're here. Make sure you invite somebody. It's going to be a very, very powerful topic. Today's going to be a fun topic. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to dive right in. Turn to James chapter 4. I know we were in James last week. If you were not with us, we actually were in the book of James last week. But it's going to be a really, really practical day today. And um, just a real quick review, not too in-depth, but understand this. James was Jesus' half-brother. So we're getting to read um, a book written in the Bible from somebody who knew Jesus really, really well. Fun fact, James did not become um, a believer in Jesus as a Messiah until after the resurrection. So he lived his whole life watching Jesus grow up, play, build stuff, and do all the things that he did, and then watched him perform a lot of miracles. And it wasn't until after the resurrection that James became a believer in the Messiah himself. And then James was a super, super kind of high-level individual in the church at Jerusalem. So the book of James is also known as the Proverbs of the New Testament. Here's what that means. Super practical, really easy to understand. We're kind of putting this, this 30,000 feet philosophy of faith into like footsteps on the dirt. If you wanted to know, man, what, what should I be doing? Everybody say doing. James is really good at that. So my challenge is, is go from this series, go from today if you haven't already, and just begin, start with James chapter 1, and just read through five short chapters, but there is a lot in those five short chapters. So James chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, let's say therefore. therefore. Love that statement. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, period. Everybody look at me. This is super important. How many of you ever said to your, to your child, how many of you have children or had children? How many of you were children? Okay, awesome. That got everybody. All right, so how many of you ever had your parents say or you looked at your kid and you said, don't ever do that again, period? Right. Have you ever said just like that? Like you had to like slow down what you were going to say because you didn't want to express any profanity in front of your kid and you were super upset and aggravated. How many parents have ever been that way? How many just went ahead and cussed anyway? Wow. Right? Had to, had to repent in front of your kid like, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, so, so like you, you, you made a statement and you put a period on the end of it and instead of just recognize it like you vocally put the punctuation at the end of the statement when you said it. Don't do that, Period. Which, which means that's really important, right? Like you had, to, you had to stop their brain from moving to the next thing because you really wanted them to get this. When you read scripture, I want to challenge you, especially right here, like he says, submit therefore to God, period. Like there's a stop before we get to the next phrase, which is what churches focus on, Christians focus on all the time. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So before we get started today, just a real quick survey inside church and Facebook Live and everywhere. How many of you ever resisted the devil real hard and you felt like it wasn't working? Like just, I'm, tr I'm trying. I'm tr like you even look like this. <laughs> right? just, just resisted the devil with all you had. And let me ask you this. And you felt like it got worse, Right? <laughs> Like, you're just like, what? come on, Lord, I am saved, born again, spirit-filled, trying to talk in tongues, and this is not working. Have you ever just did, like, you're doing everything you know to do. Like, you are greasing your house down, Crisco and your kids, doing whatever you got to do to get the devil to flee. Get... And it just keeps hanging around. Probably, not always. So let me just say this. Sometimes... 
Sometimes there is something being taught to us when the pressure is on and God wants us to persevere and press into prayer and into him. That it, that it does get extended sometimes, but here's what I want you to understand. Even in those cases, God's always working something together for your good. Right? Like, character is God's greatest desire in our life. I said that last week. I, I'm going to keep saying that because I need you to understand. We're not promised that no suffering will ever take place inside our walk with Jesus. That's not the promise. We're going to talk about a promise, but that's not it. But he says, count it all joy. When life sucks. Because you know, here's what we know. You know that that's building endurance and perseverance. And all of that builds character so that you will be perfect, lacking nothing in the end. Now, that's, that's, you need to memorize that scripture. It's awesome. It's hard to deal with, but it's the truth. So when I say this, I don't want you to, to get an undue expectation of what's going to happen in your life. But however, the promise is, if we submit to God, period, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. That's the promise. So if that's the promise, what's the problem? How many, how many, how many of you just have a problem? And it's called the devil. Sometimes you call it mother-in-law. Sometimes you call it uncle. Sometimes you call it your boss. Sometimes you call it your checking account. But we have names for it. But the truth is... It's the enemy attacking us, seeking whom he might steal, kill, and destroy from. And we all know, well, when Jesus came, that I may have life. And I don't feel like I'm having it to the fullest. I feel like I'm struggling. But I'm resisting the devil. Why isn't he fleeing? Nine times out of ten in my life, when the devil's not fleeing, it's because I'm not submitting. It's the order of Scripture. So here's what we have to understand. We have to understand God's plan. Let must say God's plan. And then, this is what we normally don't do. We have, to under, um, we have to follow God's pattern of Scripture in order to receive God's promise. So what's God's promise, particularly in James 4, 6 through 7? Hey, the devil going to flee from you. Now, that's real southern vocabulary, but it's true. The devil's going to flee from you. Well, how's that going to happen? Oh, well, you're going to resist him. And that's typically the focus. But what I want to bring to kind of uh, revelation today through the power of Holy Spirit is what James says and puts a period behind so that we all can all understand the pattern of Scripture. Submit to God, period. Pause. Now resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So, so here's, here's God's plan for everybody. Like, you just want to know, why did God send Jesus to the earth? What's, he, what's his end game? What's he's, what is he doing? He's rectifying a situation that we cause to be broken. At the end of the day, you could say it this way. God's plan is to transfer everybody. I need everybody in this room to say everybody. Because everybody. God's not exclusive. He's super inclusive. God, God sent Jesus to the world. Like, he gave his only son that whoever. Do you know what the original word means? It means Whoever. Okay, whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. So what's God's plan? He wants to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light. Like, that's it. Like, if you're here and you're new to this whole thing and you think God wants me to obey a bunch of rules, not so much. He wants to first, first, transfer you from a kingdom that's killing you, that you're deceived in, that you can't see in, that nothing's working out, and you have this undue pressure on you, which is called the kingdom of darkness, and he wants to transfer you into his kingdom of his marvelous light, which is full of love and peace and joy and patience and goodness and faithfulness, and he wants to bless you inside of it and use you inside of it to ensure that not only does that kingdom get perpetuated in your heart, but also use you to perpetuate that kingdom in the hearts of others. That's his plan. But what is his pattern? The pattern comes when we understand as children of God, as people of God, that we now live in a kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. Kingdoms function in a pattern of two things, structure and authority. So if you live in a kingdom, who, who's the authority? This is not rocket science. I know y'all are all like, I don't know. It's stressful. It's just like... Everybody say, the king. the king. Now, here's really good news. In the kingdom of light, Jesus says, I am the king of kings. 
I am the Lord of Lords, and I want to run the show. And here's the greatest thing about that. Jesus promises if you lose your life for his sake, you'll actually get life. I guess the most amazing dichotomy in the kingdom. He says, just trust me with your whole life, and I promise you, you're going to live life to the fullest because I'm the king. I wrote the book on life. I know what it looks like. I know how to do it. I know about marriage. I know about money. I know about sex. I know about everything. And if you do it my way in my kingdom under my structure and my authority, your life will be amazing. However, there's another kingdom, and the Bible calls him the God of this world, and he wants us to believe that we are our own authority, that we can do things any way that we want to, that we can rebel against everything, and somehow that's going to bring us life. And most of us, I don't even care if you're atheist in here, you understand that if you live life on your terms always every day, that it's going to go south in a hurry, that it leaves us to our addictions, our struggles, striving, and just, let me tell, me tell you what's in the kingdom of darkness. Number one guarantee in the kingdom of darkness, death. So one kingdom promises death, one kingdom promises life. Which one sounds like the better kingdom? Everybody say God's kingdom. And inside that kingdom, he makes a promise that if you submit to him and then resist the devil, the devil has no authority over you because you live in my kingdom now. I've transferred you from the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. This king no longer has authority. This is important to every Christian in here and to those who haven't made that step of faith yet. He has no authority. So why does it feel like sometimes he does? I mean, we just be honest this morning in church and say, uh, well, I feel like he has a little bit of authority, Pastor, like at least a little bit. Okay, six people are honest. This, that's awesome. Great. The rest of y'all are perfect. Please come counsel me on how to just be awesome, okay? I'm going to do the best I can from Scripture to teach you, to teach me why we stay confused and abused in the kingdom of light. Because that's not God's plan. Like God has, God has no, finds no joy in you being confused. Finds no joy in you being abused, tore up, tore down, like just can't make it through the day. What God finds joy in is when you follow his structure and his authority, which is his pattern, he finds joy in blessing you. He finds joy in empowering you. He finds joy in watching you walk in the authority, check this, that he already has given you. But there is a pattern that we have to follow. So structure actually exists in the kingdom of darkness too. I want to bring your attention to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's just comma. Let's pause. Everybody look at their wife and their husband. They are not your enemy. They were not your enemy this morning coming to church. They're not going to be your enemy tomorrow when you get up and go to work. Everybody, uh, kids are over in quest or in journey. They are not your enemy, even though I know they feel like it most of the time. Your boss is not your enemy. Your mother-in-law is not your enemy. Single person, the guy that dumped you last night or the girl that dumped you last night, not your enemy. Look at me, not. The Bible literally says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, everybody say but, <laughs> but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high Places. What does this show us? This shows us that in the spiritual realm, there is order. You could say rank, but I'm not going to use that, that term because that throws people off. So you're saying this is better than this one. This one reports to this one, kind of. But we're going to use order. Everybody say order. order. Order in the kingdom of darkness. And here's what you need to understand. Also order in the kingdom of light. And most Christians, if I'm honest, are completely oblivious that inside the kingdom that they live, that there's any order to th how things should go. And when that happens, we become confused and we get abused because we're not understanding God's plan. We're not following his pattern. Therefore, we're not receiving the promise. So this word that we see in James where it says to submit, everybody say submit. The original word's full meaning means to obey, put under, be subject to, submit oneself unto, Put in subjection under or be under obedience or obedient to. 
Actually, in the Greek-Roman time, it was a military term that was more predominantly used to mean to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion under the command of a leader. So when we see this phrase, submit to God, period, what does that mean? I mean, like practically. So you could say, according to the original definition of the word, it means to arrange oneself. Everybody say me. Me. To arrange, to position oneself under the obedience of God and his viewpoint rather than to live according to my old way based on a human viewpoint. That's what submission to God means. But whenever you start talking about structure and authority, this, this is the thing that the devil wants you to be most confused over. Because he knows if he can get you pushing back, rebelling against it, not accepting it, or confused over it, then he can wreak havoc in your life and keep you confused and abused. And eventually, you will say, none of this is true. It doesn't work. And you'll walk away. So my goal today in teaching you this tiny little powerful scripture is that God is faithful, God is true, and God is honest all the time. We just don't pay attention to where the periods and commas are most of the time. He says, submit, therefore, to God, period. Everybody say period. Period. So what does that mean? What does it even look like? I'm going to give you three things today that submission to God very practically looks like. Because a lot of people say, oh, I love Jesus. How many of you in here love Jesus? Like, Barnett just made everybody say, I love Jesus, okay? So everybody says, I love Jesus. And everybody says, I love his word. And most people will say, maybe not in this way, but somehow you say, well, yes, yes, yes. I submit my life to the Lord. Well, let's just see. Let, let's, let's just take an inventory, because this is an inventory in my life, as much as it is yours, I'm not preaching at you, I'm living through this process with you, because I want the devil to flee. How many of y'all down with that, at least? Like, let's, let's get the devil all out the house, okay? How does that work? Number one, if I say I'm submitted to God, I'm placing myself under obedience to him, then I can't say that and not agree with what I'm about to say, which means I'm also submitted to his word. If I say the Bible, because this, this book, Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's all relevant, it's all true, and it, and it all should be applied to our life because in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says that this, this, this word, the Bible, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correction, and training in right living. Your Bible says training in righteousness. What that means is, is training in right living. It also says in Hebrews 4.12 that this, this is alive. Like it's not, just, it's not just paper. Like it's alive. And it also says it's active. How many of you ever read it and it like jumped out at you? And you were like, oh. How many of you ever had that happen to you? Like, I just wish I hadn't read that. Like, just, mm. okay, so why? Because it's alive, and it literally says it divides soul and spirit. Like, it's, it's not just, I mean, I know people call it the book, and that's cool, but it's really the Bible. It's alive and active, and, the, and it promises, God promises that every time you read it, it won't not do anything. Like it will do what it's supposed to do. Well, what's it supposed to do? Teach me, train me, correct me, rebuke me, and divide soul and spirit. That's what it does. I never make the Bible line up to my life. I line my life up to the Bible. And so this makes this thing the ultimate authority in our life. And I don't get, here's here's what submission means. I don't get to debate or argue it. How many of you ever said the word, yes, sir? How many of you ever said that? Now, if you're, if you're 50 and under, I know you did. Okay? How many of you ever said, well, yes, sir? How many of you said yes, sir, and didn't agree? But you did it anyway. You're like, yes, sir. And you went and did it. Now, God is loving God is merciful, but here, here's what God, like, wants for you. 
He wants you to trust him. How many of you ever told your kid to do something? They went, I don't, I don't, I don't want it. And he went, look, look, look. Shh. Trust me. Just do it. And then their little six-year-old self would say, well, you don't understand. And he went, I ain't got to understand. I'm older than you, wiser than you. You may be smarter than me in your little sixth grade math that I can't help you with. But the truth is, <laughs> how many of you ever had that happen? Like you, you just know you six-year-old smarter than you. But they don't know as much as you. And you went, just trust me. Like, I got a long way. I got a lot of experience. Just trust me. That's what God's saying when he wrote this word. Like, it wasn't up for, well, can we, can we talk about it? No, no, no. Like, I am the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of your faith. I know a lot. Matter of fact, my ways are not even your ways, and my thoughts are not even your thoughts. So, trust me. And when we do that, I'm just honest with you, it's great. So there's two phrases that happen in Christians' lives all the time. They say things like, well, I feel. Have you ever said that? I feel like I should. Or we said this, God told me. Have you ever said that? Listen, raise your hand. It's okay. Nobody's, Joy Bayer's not here. She's not going to call you insane. Okay. <laughs> We're all safe in the house of the Lord. I hope she comes. But anyway, so she's not here. Because the truth is, Jesus does talk to us. God does talk to us, and it doesn't make us insane. It makes us his children. It makes us his sheep. The Bible literally says, my sheep know my voice. So he does speak to us. But if I could just kind of help you, because there are people who said, God told me, and they did some kind of atrocity. What did they not do? They didn't line up the voice that they heard with the word that's already written. So if you're here and God speaks to you, and I hope he does because he speaks to me all the time. He speaks to you first. Everybody say first. first. Through his word. Don't, don't ever get it twisted that like God's going to give you some kind of revelation to add to this thing. The book actually ends with a pretty hard saying about if somebody adds or takes away from this thing, you just need to know they're terribly cursed. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a curse. So, so I'm never going to say God said and not quote this. So like if somebody super spiritual is in your life and say, God told me to tell you, I give you permission to say, well, you just hold out on that and let him tell me. <laughs> really? It's, a, it's the most freeing thing in the world. <laughs> like God told me to tell you. Hold up. Stop right there. Because if it don't begin with 2 Timothy or first, or Hebrews, can we just wait and you pray that God reveals it to me? Because I am his child and he talks to me all the time. Now listen, I'm not saying that those aren't valid sometimes, but what I'm saying is, is everything that is said with the Lord said should be backed up with his word, and then the second thing, God's character. Because let me tell you, Satan, Satan knows the word. He just says it out of context and out of character. He wants you to live outside the will of God by using the word of God. He did it to Jesus. Don't think he won't do it to you. So you got to know his word, but you also have to know his character. So remember, submission means to arrange oneself under the obedience of. So this is, are we, most of us in here at least, are, are we all in agreement by show of hands? This is God's authority. This is God's word. Raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Then the next one's going to be easy now. Number two, submission to leadership. Submission to lead, I have to be submitted to the word, and I have to be submitted to the leaders that God placed over me. So let me just read to you from the word, Romans 13, 1 through 4. So before I read it, are we all in agreement that God's word is true, and we don't get to argue with it? Let's raise our hand. Okay, awesome. Agreement does great things. Let everyone, holy cow, there's that word again. See, God's really inclusive. Everybody say everyone. everyone. Let everyone be subject. Let's just stop right there. The word subject means to place under obedience to. There's that word again. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Let's listen to this last line. This is the worst line in the Bible. For there is no authority except that which God has established. <laughs> Praise Jesus. God put my boss in my life. No, I'm sorry, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
The Lord elected President Trump. <laughs> she had six people was like, praise God. <laughs> the rest of you is like, oh, gosh, I need to pray harder. <laughs> Listen, I'm just, that's what the Bible says. There is no authority, no, no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Verse 3, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Look at me. How many of you ever been super nervous when the police was behind you? Just all been out of shape, like start shaking. How many of you ever had a cop pass you and you didn't even look? <laughs> Listen, after have, being a police officer, let me just tell you, if I passed you and you didn't even look or at least give me one knees, I'm pulling you over in the no-look zone because you are doing something illegal. I got to find something to get you to the side of the road because I just know you're like, I'm sitting next to you at a red light, and you won't even look and be like, hey, police officer, thank you for keeping me safe. You're like, you are criminal. That's just, how many of you know that's true? How many, how many just, listen, let's be honest. The police got behind you, and you were scared because you ran a red light on 6th Avenue, but you turned on 67. You thought he saw you. are like, oh, my gosh. Lord, I am so sorry. Please bless me. <laughs> Have you ever did that? Like, so here's, Scripture sets all of us free, and it says, look, if you're doing what's right, you don't have to be scared of the police. <laughs> if you got a dime in you, and y'all, some of y'all know what a dime is, I ain't talking about it. <laughs> so, I saw everybody that wished they lived in Colorado right now. <laughs> a dime. <laughs> yeah, listen, if you're in Alabama and got a dime in your pocket, you better be nervous because you're going to jail. That's, that's why you don't look. You don't wave. You don't talk. You just walk down the street. <laughs> Verse 3, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of all authority? Then do what's right. Stop breaking the law. It's simple. Don't tell me the Bible's not relevant. Verse 4, for the one in authority is God's servant. Check this out. For your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. It's called jail, prison. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants. So it's not just talking about the police, it's not just talking about the government, it's actually talking about every authority that's established in the earth. That, uh, that structure was established by God for your good. Every time I ever had a bad boss, the truth is, it wasn't so much about the boss as it was about me. It was about God teaching me something in my life that I needed to learn because my default is rebellion. How many of you just know that's true about you? Like, I want to talk about everybody and everything and how they need to be doing it. Yeah, but you're not doing it. Can you, like, the number of people that get on social media and talk about if I was president. Yeah, but you ain't. <laughs> if I was elected, well, you were not elected. And, and I understand you feel like I would do this, I would do that. But the truth is you have no idea the amount of pressure and or stress it takes to run the free world. Because you're running the free world. You're not just running the United States of America. And you have to handle a world economy. But you can't even balance your checkbook talking about I want to be president. <laughs> so here's the issue people say all the time. In the church now. So now we'll, we'll go from government into church. And there's a structure here of authority and how it works. Well, I don't need, I ain't no man telling me what to do. We all got the same Holy Spirit. We don't need pastors, teachers, leaders. Let's just all come in here and flow. The problem with that statement is, is you cannot submit to God and rebel against his word at the same time. If you're not submitted to God, you're yielding to the devil, and that's called pride and rebellion. The only promise in that kingdom is death, and there's no gray area. 
That is the one thing I appreciate about God. There's no gray area. It's black or white, dark or light. You choose death or life. And he makes it really practical and really simple. But we feel like that we know the best way. And if you do that, then you have zero authority over the devil in your life. And he has the right to come in and wreak havoc in your life. Because the truth is, God does not run errands on the earth. He delegates authority to do that. God's in heaven watching over, and nothing happens on this planet that does not pass through his hands. But what you need to understand is God delegates the authority to move the kingdom forward in the earth, and he takes it super serious. He gives them both the responsibility and the authority to do it. So much so, he says, not many of you should desire to be teachers because you will be held to a higher standard than everybody else. Which one makes so important what I do from this platform every weekend? Really, really awesome, but also the Bible tells me to study myself approved. I can't get up here and give you my opinion. I only have the opportunity to give you the word. If I do that, when I get to heaven, God's going to say, great job. But if I get off sideways and I lead people astray, I'll pay for that. And just so you know, I'd rather not pay for that. I'm sure over 15 years of preaching, there's some stuff he's going to say, I don't know about that phrase, okay? I'm not perfect. I grow all the time, just like you do. I'm in the Word. I'm learning. But the truth is, I take it super serious. So if you're in here and you desire to teach the Word, to lead people, to mentor people, God says, hey, that's awesome. But not everybody should shoot for that because you're going to be held to a higher standard at the end. So what does that practically look like in our life? Anything to do with our own personal life, we have direct access to the Father through our high priest, Jesus. We can go straight to him about stuff that's going on in life. But kingdom, everybody say kingdom. kingdom. Anything to do with kingdom advancement, God will tell you to go to his delegated authority. So if, like, if we're going to do something as a church, by all means, pray and seek God about it. But then when you get ready to make that decision, step out, God's going to instruct you or expect you to go to the authority that he set up in the church. That we're just not running rogue. God does not need superstars, hot shots, and ball hogs. He needs people that come together as a family. How many of you ever played football? How many of you ever watched football? So we, live, we live in Alabama. Everybody raise your hand. Okay. Good stuff. It's second to Jesus, I think, sometimes in Alabama. All right, so the truth is, is when the ball is snapped, there's two people on either side of it. There's a person in the middle called a center, and there's two people on the outside, and they're called tackles, offensive tackles, right and left offensive tackles. When the ball is snapped, can I tell you what they don't know? What each other's doing. Can I tell you what they don't care? What each other's doing. They're doing their job. And they have zero time to look up and look over to see what each other's doing because they're handling their lane. Now, there is a person that knows. He's called the quarterback. And if the blindside tackle, if you watch football, you know what I'm talking about. If the blindside tackle is not doing his job, he's painfully aware over and over and over again. Okay? But so his job, the quarterback's job, is to correct the offensive tackle that's not getting the job done according to the playbook, not what he would like. Here's what you need to understand. When they're in the huddle... And the blindside tackle has just let him get drilled. He's saying, look, man, we just ran X play. This is what you're supposed to do. And I need you to start doing it according to the playbook that you learned and what you know. Inside church, if everybody was in their lane doing what they were supposed to do, what they were called and anointed to do, there would be no cross-arguing. But you've got to have a quarterback that watches everything that says, hey, according to the playbook, this is how this should happen. The other tackle's job is to encourage the tackle that just got corrected. Come on, man. You know it's a playbook. You know the quarterback wants to win. Let's just, let's just do our job. We can do this. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. So look at your neighbor and say, you're anointed and talented to do what you do. <laughs> so the third and final thing is submission to positional order. I had this broken up in four points, and I was in the green room praying over it, and I was like, that's just three. You made an A and B, so just make it three. How many like it when I make it simple? Okay, so this made it really simple. So we have to have submission to the word, submission to the leaders, because 
we submit to the word, and God says there's no leadership except that I gave you. And then submission to positional order. And there's a difference between the family of God and the army of God. So really quick, if you've been in the military, you'll know this. If not, we're in a military world. You kind of know this. Let's say there's a general. That's a guy that has stars up here. Everybody know that? He's, he's kind of a big deal. There's a general who has three kids. One of the kids is a captain, one of the kids is a lieutenant, and one of the kids is a sergeant. When they're at home, there is still awareness that dad's a general, brother's a captain, brother's a lieutenant, and brother's a sergeant. But they're not necessarily following orders at that moment. But they still are aware Dad's a general, this is a captain, but we're just sitting down eating dinner and hanging out. But when they get called to war, what changes automatically? The following and perception of what's going on is the only thing that changes. Because they were still aware that dad was a general. But when they're on the battlefield, orders take place. Because they don't have time to discuss whether or not this is the right decision. We've got to advance our ideology, our philosophy. If you put it in kingdom perspective, we've got to advance our kingdom. I'm not really worried about your opinion of how the chairs should be set or should we be doing this or should we be doing that. I need it to happen. I'm calling the shots from a perspective that you don't see. So the captain gets that order, passes it to the lieutenant, the lieutenant passes it to the sergeant, and the sergeant passes it to the troops. And that's how it has to happen. It doesn't mean that after the battle's over that we all can't talk about that decision. But during the battle, we don't talk about that decision. It, it's where we say the term, yes, sir. Everybody say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But in our, world, in our world, that's very difficult. We don't, like to talk, we don't like to call people pastor. We don't like to call people Mr. President. We don't like to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, to our parents. And, and even, there's even an age where they're raising little kids and they're like, oh, you don't have to do that. You can say yeah and no because I understand you're just answering the question. What we don't understand is those phrases were designed to help us be aware of position, which helps us honor. And inside the world, inside the world, there's no recognition of position or honor and it's complete chaos, and we can expect nothing else because if we go against what God's word says, the devil doesn't have to flee in here, and he don't have to flee out there. Why are we in wars all the time? Because of this reason right here. Why do we have violence? Because of this reason right here. If you meet somebody in a position of authority, we should be saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. To include teachers that teach your children. Yes. Parents, you should not say disrespectful things about the person in authority over your, over your son or your daughter. I'm not saying they're perfect. What I am saying is don't say that. Student, if you're in here, let me just help you. You want to be able to move from a C to a B? Like, you know, you know when you get the C and it's like, man, that could almost be a B. How many of you ever a 78 and wish it was an 80? Let me help you. If you're the kid that's always, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Can I do that? I know y'all don't have erasers. Y'all have dry boards now. You got to wipe the dry board. Can I, like, can I help you? Let me tell you what's going to happen on your little report card. <laughs> oh, man, that, that could, that's almost a B. He is so, she is so polite. I'm just going to arc that up a little bit. How many would like to have that happen in your life? Yeah. You smiling. I know you would. You're like, heck, yeah. Can I go from a B to an A? That'd be awesome. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. How can I help you? How can I serve you? You're my leader. You're awesome. I'm going to help you. It's, listen, how many would like to be promoted? Listen, I'm setting y'all free. How many would like to be promoted? Get a raise, something. The guy who gets the raise, everybody calls him a brown noser. Actually, he's the person that understands authority. Actually, he's the person that understands honor. And everybody else, he makes them feel bad. You just brown nosing. You just stuck up his rear end. No, I say yes, sir, and no, sir. And I come in if they need me to come in, which is why I leave your rear end behind, and I'll be your boss in about six months. <laughs> okay. So, the next thing is, if we understand positional order, let me help all of us. Don't do things you're not called or anointed to do. This is super important in the church. So we talked about life at large, and it's super helpful, helpful, and the Bible's super practical. The 1 Corinthians 12 says this, and it's actually speaking to positional order. 
We don't, we don't read it this way most of the time, but this is what it's saying. Just as a body, though one, everybody look at their body, okay? It's one, right? Like you're not sitting beside yourself. You're one person. Is that right? Okay, so just as one body, though one, has many parts. Everybody look at your parts. Don't look at me. Everybody look at you like you got fingers and hands. How many got feet and stuff like that? Okay, so has a lot of parts, but all its many parts form one body. How many, how many are thinking right now, this is not rocket science, Lord? Like I got it. Okay, he's trying to dumb it down so we all can get it. For we are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. Everybody say the church. church. We're all baptized in one spirit to form one body, whether Jews, Gentiles, slave or free. We're all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but many. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary. Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. Everybody look at me. You can't run an army without a sergeant. Everybody thinks the general's the most important. He's actually not. You can't run an army without troops. This is what it's saying. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving a greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. What does that mean? Honor others above yourself. No matter what position you hold in the earth or in the church, honor goes both ways. So there'll be no division in the body. Ephesians 4 says, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were put here by Jesus himself to build up the body in the fullness of Christ. Here's what I need you to understand. Those are not spiritual gifts. They're positions in the church. Most people erroneously get this wrong. Pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and apostles are positions or offices in the church. They're not a spiritual gift. There is a list of spiritual gifts that you can go to. I don't have time to go to. But what happens is somebody discovers their spiritual gift, and all Christians get one. And they start flowing in their spiritual gift, and man, this is awesome, this is killer, I got the gift of mercy, or whatever it is that you got going on, and you start jiving in it, and you get really fired up, and that's awesome. But what happens is, is it causes you sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, to slide out of the position. And you start doing things that you're not called nor anointed to do. So for example, I'm just going to start with intercessory prayer. How many know what that is? Raise your hand. Because if you don't, I want to teach you. Okay, so like a quarter of you, raise your hand. Intercessory prayer is not a spiritual gift. <gasps> I know y'all been taught different. If you grew up in church your whole life, you're like, no, that's a spiritual gift. No, it's not. It's actually a command to all Christians. All Christians are to be an intercessor prayer person. Whatever, however you're supposed to say that, okay? All Christians are supposed to intercede in prayer for other people. There's a list in Scripture, and it's all authority, ministers, Jerusalem, friends, fellow countrymen, sick, enemies, those who persecute us, those who forsake us, and just so you know, everybody. And it, the Bible says every Christ follower is to intercede on behalf of the list I just read you. So intercessory prayer is not a spiritual gift. Some people lean more toward that practice because they have the spiritual gift of mercy. And they come to you and say, man, I, just got, I really got a heart for you. Can I pray for you? And then here's what, here's what people in my position do. Oh, man, you got the gift of intercessory prayer. No, you don't. You're following the scriptural command of all Christians. You got the gift of mercy. I would love for you to pray for me. I believe in intercessory prayer, and I believe people are called to certain people because of the gift of mercy. But intercessory prayer itself is not a spiritual gift. So here's what happens. When you get into deep prayer, you start getting visions of things way in the future. Have you ever had that happen? You're like in deep prayer, and you see somebody about to make a bad decision, or you get some kind of strange vision where you have to try to interpret what that meant, or you have a dream. Have you ever had a dream? And it was weird. It was all in color, and you could smell, and it was like you were there, and there was somebody you were close to in the dream, and a 
truck was chasing them down an alley, and you're like, oh, my gosh. And the truck was brown. And like, you just go through these things. And you come out of that vision, or you come out of that dream. Now, don't be nervous. The Bible says, I will speak to my kids in visions and dreams. But what's our positional responsibility when that happens? It's not to text them immediately out of that dream. Do not text them at 6 o'clock when you woke up with the vision of 75 snakes. Okay? Listen to me. Don't text them because a bear was chasing them in the woods, or they shot a deer, and the deer fell, and they fed 25 people. Don't do that. What's your responsibility? Go back to the prayer closet. Because you may have had a vision of something that was going to happen, and all God called you to do was pray for it, because the heavenlies open up when a righteous man prays, and stuff stops and doesn't happen in their life. And they didn't need to know about it. Because they weren't where you were. And they weren't in that deep place. So what's the positional order in God's house? Because here's what I believe. I believe God is moving in that way in this house. I believe God is opening up miracles in this house. We're already seeing them. But I owe it to you as the lead pastor of this church to train you. When you get a vision and you get a dream, what do I need to do? First and foremost, take it to God in prayer. God, what would you have me do? Is this just for me to pray, or do I need to tell somebody? And you just feel this overwhelming sense, i gotta, I got to tell somebody. Then you go to a staff pastor, and you send that in the email, very detailed out. This was my dream. Would you pray with me as to what I'm to do with this? And if the pastor says, I believe, I've been in prayer, I believe, you just need to keep this to yourself and keep praying about it. That's what you do. Because people in position of leadership are anointed to know the times, the places, and the ways to release information. Everybody's not. But some people come out of there and they decide, no, I'm going to be a prophet. Or I'm going to be a prophetess. And I'm going to tell somebody. And what that does is it causes us to get out of order. And we get out of order, we wind up manipulating people and scaring people. God is not an author of confusion. God does not bring fear. Fear is a spirit. We, as Christ followers, never want to do anything to partner with fear or confusion. So listen, have your dreams. Seek God, but just know and recognize submission to positional order and how that works. If we'll do these things, submit to the Word. How many agree with that one? I should submit to the Word of God. Okay, how many should agree? I should submit to leadership. May not like it, may not agree with it, but God put it in place, so therefore I have to submit to it. We agree with that. You may not want to, but we do. We should submit to positional order because God says so, and he put it in place so that there would be order in his house. God is a God, is a God of order. And wherever there is order, let me tell you what exists there. Power. Power and authority exist in order. Now you can walk in authority over that thing that's wreaking havoc in your life. And you can resist the devil, and he has to flee. Because you know God's plan. You're following God's pattern. Now walk in God's promise. Does that help you today? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the clarity and the simplicity of your word. May we hide it in our heart that we would be found faithful with a little so that you would entrust us with much. God, I thank you for everyone on the sound of my voice, the life change that has been brought to them through the teaching and preaching of your word because it promises to never return void. Your word says that Holy Spirit will preach and teach a better word than I can. So God, I claim that. I thank you for that. And I send these out blessed and in your favor to move your kingdom forward in their hearts and in the hearts of others. In Jesus' name, everybody said, love you guys.